can I, can I just restart? This is a multimedia day, as you can see. <laughs> we're, we're starting uh, Professor Norris's uh, session, first of all, with some music, and then he is talking to us. But there probably won't be time for questions at the end. Thank you. <coughs> I should like to introduce George Paris and the Caris singers who will start by singing Harold Noble's setting of Lydgate's poem, Henry IV, as in the And then joined by the ladies of the Caris singers after I've spoken for a little bit, the, uh, they will end the session by singing Edward Rendell's dramatic ballad, Antincourt, which is a setting of Drayton. So this is Lydgate. I'll give you a D.
The first music that was inspired by the Battle of Agincourt was the Agincourt Carol. And that was published in the late 1770s by both Charles Burney and John Stafford Smith in transcriptions from a manuscript in the Pepys Library in Cambridge. And if you want to know all about that, Helen Deeming has written a marvellous article in uh, the music where she suggests that it may have originated as a unison effusion of song at the pageant in London which marked Henry's victorious return, and that it was later, in East Anglia, worked up in counterpoint, with the unison opening retained as a reminder of the original occasion. This facsimile of the Pageant Court Carol, which you'll get to know before very long, uh, was published by Fulham Maitland in 1891. We'll come to that. In his general history of music, Charles Burney presents his transcription with grandiloquent dismissiveness. A faithful copy of this venerable relic of our nation's prowess and glory in the beginning of the 15th century, from which we are perhaps entitled to more honour than from the poetry and music with which they were then celebrated, which echoes the comment in Percy's Reliques of 1765, which had presented the lyrics without the tune, that our plain and martial ancestors could wield their swords much better than their pens would appear from the following homely rhymes. <laughs> None of these 18th century publications, nor some ghastly reharmonizations by Edward Rimbaud in 1847 and William Chapel in 1855, succeeded in establishing the carol in the public mind. In fact, Agincourt's musical legacy took almost 500 years to arrive. The battle merits a brief mention, along with Cressy, in a patriotic pot boiler of 1803 by Charles Dibdin. And uh, there you see it's linked with Cressy. 1803 was no time really to remember victories over the French, possibly. Um, and in 1865, Colonel Woodhouse, of whom we heard this morning, with Bandmaster James Smith, produced certainly the best cover, though possibly the worst music. <laughs> Only after Fuller Maitland had published his transcription of the carol roll that was in the library of Trinity College in Cambridge in 1891, with its frontispiece that uh, that's in the before, did the idea of Agincourt really begin to creep into the repertoire. The best of the offerings of the 1890s appeared in 1897, perhaps as a jubilee tribute. Edward Reynolds' Agincourt, a ballad of M. Drayton for baritone, solo, and chorus, with trumpets cued into the piano accompaniment, a setting of the famous ballad that begins, There Stood the Wind of France. And it's a very well wrought ten minutes, and we shall hear it just later on. In 1913, Rafe Warren Williams wrote incidental music for Sir Frank Benson's Stratford season, which included Henry V performed by Stratford Grammar School boys and some of their female relatives. I suspect it was a cost-cutting exercise. <laughs> and the incomplete orchestral parts in the Shakespeare Memorial Library in Stratford reveal that the Agincourt Carol tune opens the overture, the first time the cow had been used in a composition. And it so happens that this particular Stratford folder has not previously been noticed by musicians. So this is actual news. The fact that Warren Williams was the first person to use the Agincourt cow in a piece of music. Uh, interestingly enough, the details of the words that he uses show that he used the Bodleian Library version rather than the one that resided in his own trunk. In 1933, Warren Williams revisited that 1913 overture and he recomposed it for brass band interpolating martial fanfares in a pastoral section based on the French folk to Magali, which had appeared in several instrumental numbers in his incidental music for the play. Both versions of that overture end with the Earl of Oxford's march, but in the 1933 rewrite, Warren Williams introduces the old French marching song, Réveillez-vous Bigard, Réveillez-vous Bigard, which is which it didn't feature anywhere in the 1913 music. And I wonder whether it was his discovery of that melody that prompted his revision. The revision, oddly enough, was not performed until 1979. That becomes less surprising when we note that Vaughan Williams made a note on the manuscript that he wanted trumpets, not cornets, with their brass band vibrato, which is not a remark calculated to please brass band. 
Uh, jumping back to 1919, the Royal College of Music was counting the cost of the Great War. The Royal College of Music's war memorial was a very poignant thing, as you enter that mighty building. Sir Charles Stanford had seen many of his composition students enlist, and he wrote a substantial orchestral movement called A Song of Petticoat in commemoration of those members of the college who fought, worked, and died for their country. It was first performed at the college on the 25th of March, 1919. Stanford, also a Trinity man, and Vaughan Williams' teacher at the RCM, had been interested in J.A. Fuller Maitland's transcriptions of ancient musical manuscripts when they were undergraduates together. And so you could see a little knot of musicians grouping around Fuller Maitland at Trinity in Cambridge. You've got Fuller Maitland and Stanford, and Stanford's pupil, Vaughan Williams, also a Trinity man all using the ancient call piano. Like all British composers of his generation, most of whom had studied at Leipzig, Stanford was soaked in the idioms and habits of German musical thought. During the Great War, most German music had been shunned by promoters and audiences. This was almost as disconcerting to professional musicians as if today any music with, say, an American source was banned in Britain. No more jazz, no rock music. And one result was to leave a space which younger consciously English composers could fill during the 1920s. In this context, Stanford's choice of the Agincourt melody for his tribute is significant. A, me a melody that commemorates an English victory in France, certainly, but above all, a melody that can have no hint of German influence. And he tries hard to strike out in other new directions as well. Uh, I've got a few excerpts of the uh, piece to play for you. So, excellent. Here, is the opening of Stanford's <coughs> Song of Agincourt, in which you'll hear the famous tune. <laughs>
Gabriel Williams gone away, I think, there. Very much English pastoral music. And another way that Stanford managed to avoid Germanic references was to write an Irish G command. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I have here, uh, Walter Lee is not very well known. Um, you'll see why in a moment, but here's a. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not what I'm <coughs> You'll regret that. You'll regret that. Um, here's a rather charming picture of Walter and the future Mrs. Lee in 1933. And uh, the uh, overture is going to be performed at the end of performance of this overture this year, an overture called Action Court. The only performance of it is here will be in Southampton on Saturday. More anon. Um, Lee's mother was German, and Lee studied at Cambridge and in Berlin. And he introduces the Agincourt Carol to as a pastoral interlude, moving through sorrow to a solemn sobriety, quite unlike its usual triumphal treatment. The overture remained unpublished at the time of his death from friendly fire at the Battle of Tobruk in North Africa. 1942, which is why we don't know very much about him. It was in 1944 that Walton composed the most enduring Agincourt score for Lance Olivier's film Henry V. The late Michael Kennedy, who knew both composers as well, told me that Walton consulted Paul Williams about the music. And so it's not surprising to find him incorporating the tune of Reveillez vous Picard, which is the tune that Paul Williams discovered, to personify the French in a fine battle fugato, a typical Waltonian vigour. Reviewing the music in the serious musical magazine Tempo, Hubert Clifford wrote, I had never previously been aware of the essential Englishness of Walton. But in Henry V, there was an authentic English musical voice, as English in its own way as that of Elgar or Paul Williams, which I find a, a most intriguing fact. Um, Harold Noble's part song from 1947, uh, we've heard. Uh, it was part of the Mortimer series of modern part songs, and the very next item in the series was Elizabeth of England by Hayden Wood. So the occasion of both compositions may have been our present queens coming of age. Now I'd like to finish this part with uh, this, this quick survey of Agincourt music before we have more live music with a reference to my own treatment of the Agincourt song in my piece Turning Points, which also will be performed in Southampton 
on Saturday, along with William Walton and Walter Lee. I'll show you our poster. You might recognise the art. We borrowed the art from the Ring Book. Um, rather like Lee, I use a disjointed version of the carol melody to accompany the lament of one of Alan Chartier's Cats for Dame. But the chief presentation in my piece of the Anti Court Carol is a chorale prelude, a fugal piece with inversions and strettos to be technical, uh, where it appears in a manner reminiscent, and I'm rather pleased with this, reminiscent of the armed men in Mozart's Magic Flute. Uh, and since the premiere is not until Saturday, I can only play you a synthesized version of the section. Um, and I will do that. You'll have to uh, put up with the synthesized sound. We come out of my own setting of Fairs for the Wind of France and into Henry's entrance, which culminates in a quotation from Elgar's Pastor, Henry's royal theme, and then into the Chorale Prelude. And you'll hear the carol in the men's voices in deep octaves, as in the Mozart. And I'll just find it here. So this is an extract from my piece, Turning Points, and it's the Agincourt Carol in Octaves. Here's Henry coming in, and here's the quote from Elgar. well-known description of Henry. He was, in his youth, a diligent follower of idle practices. Set her unaccompanied solo voices, and I must thank Professor Curry for her help with sources uh, that have read there. Thank you very much, Anna. The piece has received funding, I have to say, from the Antiport Commemoration Committee, Antiport 600, and it will be repeated in St Paul's Church, Covent Garden, on October 1st, along with my academic and church there, and simply, and you're all very welcome. So to sum up, before we have more live music, Anticorp owes its unique place in music to the strength of its carol tune, whose strenuous phrases fall only to leap up again. The melody is so near in time to the battle that it can be felt to grow out of the actual experience, like its words. No other battle has spawned a comparable tune. The multiple ironies of Malbrook, Sombrac, and Gael rule out any rivalry from Malplac. The nearest parallel is the 1683 siege of Vienna, which introduced Turkish music, based around triangle and symbols, into Viennese classical music, a process that reached its apogee in Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. But that's a texture, not a tune, and it signified a general exoticism or vulgarity rather than war, or the pity, or even the triumph of war. Once Eric Coates is out of copyright in 2027, we may see something done with the diversities. But until then, the fortuitous relevance of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony's Leave of Victory in Morse Code as a symbol of the Second World War merely emphasizes Agincourt's richness. The ancient tune is musically most fruitful when it embodies some aspect of the idea of Agincourt. In Stanford and Walton, 
we see it as a theme to national identity. In Lee's regretful pastoral, we may see a conscious internationalism. These ideas remain a contentious issue for the world over, and had you got half a musical code and made a player half yet in both the articulation of aspiration and the warnings of the wise for the future. Which reminds me that the most important line in my libretto is taken from the Mark of St. Denis, which is the annals of France should have served as lessons to the laws of France in the forms of history. Now, we're going to be joined by the Paris singers again, and their director, George Paris, and we're going to conclude this session with Edward Rendell's Asgott. It's impossible to tell, of course, how much the two pieces that you've heard this <coughs> afternoon have been performed since they were written, but I should imagine very, very little. 